Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I figured this out. Perfect. Uh, have you done have you done many of these Zoom meetings yet? Just for podcasts. Um, but no, I don't I don't really have anything else, <laughs> anything else to Zoom. Yeah. Really at this point. Well, that's good. Thank How's you for that? your time today, Evan. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm flattered you reached out. Well, if it's okay with you, I always ask permission if we can use any of the video for our promotion of the episode on YouTube or whatever. If not, that's totally okay too. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally good with it. By the way, you do an excellent job. I um, I oh. was checking out your podcast and um, I was like, gosh, she's like a Terry Gross. You're great at the uh, the interview. Really? I wish Thank I, you. I wish I had your acumen. <laughs> That means a lot. Thanks so much. Cause I'm pretty green at this. So it's kind of Some something more natural kind of started You're it natural. right before. Thanks. Right before the pandemic was when it was coming together to do this podcast, but then that just happened and gave me something to do. <laughs> right. Have you ever I'm done talking. voiceovers before? No, no. I I do fun... get to it. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. That would be something fun to do. I would enjoy that. I'd listen to a book you read. Can you read some books for me? Is that way I can, I can put them on tape and uh, <laughs> that would be a great. <laughs> sure. No problem. All right. Good deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on Dope Nostalgia Podcast, we talk about what happened in the 90s as well as what you're doing now. So it's a good mix of the two. And yeah, we'll go from there. <laughs> so you're expecting me to remember the 90s is what you're saying. <laughs> okay. You were kind of like the together thing was very much 2000s, wasn't it? Like 99, 2000? Let's see. I think we shot, we shot in either eight, 98 or 99, mm -hmm. somewhere right in there. And then the film and then the series started 2000. So yeah, yeah, it was kind of, kind of across the, the Y2K <laughs> time period. Yeah. So I, I'm cool with like, things that happened in the early 2000s because so much of it started in the 90s and I mean the boy band thing was huge for me and a lot of our listeners so um when you guys set out to do together was it to be a parody originally was that the idea or was there a point where you all felt we're an actual band now so so I got the script through my agent and um <clears throat> it was just a regular movie audition I, I, the script was um was brilliantly written the uh, gun cousins they're, the whole dynasty of the gun family their writers mm -hmm. uh movies um uh, the, they're the who's who of um of a lot of the hit movies but the cousin it was just i think their big foray mark and um uh, brian gunn and i thought it was one of the funniest things i ever read and ironically uh <laughs> i was doing i was doing on uh, theater at the time i was doing the fantastics off broadway and nice. I remember my agent had just moved offices. The script came to me late. It was very 11th hour. And I was really debating whether or not I, I had the energy to do the audition. They, they wanted me to put myself on tape, which back then you always came into the agency office to do that. And they had a facility for that. And I was like, really, I've got to tape myself. And I remember uh, a friend of mine was like, just, just do it. I'll help you. So we literally went to an abandoned building above, which is, the, the space above the theater before a show um, mm -hmm. did one take of the, uh, the audition scene. And um, I think I had to sing a song. I want to say I sang um, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday boys to men or, and, or um, I might be getting a couple of them confused. No diggity. <laughs> uh. um, classic, classic. 90s so good. Song. Um, yeah, I set the tape off and then I, I, I don't want to say I forgot about it, but you know, at that kind of stage of my, of my life, I was just kind of doing, it's a numbers game and I was doing a million things at once. And, um, and then all of a sudden I remember, um, no, God, things happen really fast. Sorry. I'm kind of reliving it. I really haven't thought about a lot of this. And then, um, I got really lucky, um, and booked my first big film, which was Shaft. And I was playing one of Christian Bale's obnoxious Upper East Side, friends in the opening scene with Mackay Pfeiffer and Samuel Jackson and um it was it was all very overwhelming but um I remember I was I was sitting on <laughs> on set 
of Shaft and my agent called and was like, hey, you got the part in this this together thing and it's going to be a big deal. It's MTV's first made for TV movie. It's the spinal tap of boy bands, which is essentially the, the question that you asked. I'm sorry, kind of long winded, but cool. it was designed to be the, the spinal tap mockumentary. Um, uh, very much like Spinal Tap, but of boy bands, which of course was the biggest thing at the time. Yeah. And um, and so I actually, um, I left shooting Shaft and went straight to um, Vancouver and we shot the film, I believe in like three weeks. And then we kind of all just sat back and we're like, is this thing going to happen and, and be, be a big deal or not? And then when it aired, it, it was so, it was such art imitating itself. Um, we manufactured this big premiere if we're a real band. So the way they marketed us was very much on both sides. The pretending that we were a real band, all the while we were making a band, or making fun of boy bands um, <laughs> in the mockumentary format, so to speak. It was also, I say making fun of, but it was very much a loving tribute at the same time. Yeah. It's very weird. It was everything all at once, you know? Yeah. And then, um, and then it turned into a TV series, the success of the movie they, they called, and I almost didn't do the series. Um, the, the film had done, had opened some doors for me and I was really uh, seriously considering some other options and um, MTV is not known for paying uh, people very well. And so mm -hmm. they assumed I was turning down because of the low money and I was not. <laughs> so eventually they brought up the money and I was like, okay, I'd be stupid not to take this. So that's how the series kind of kind of happened. and. Um, the rest, of, as they say, is history. Yeah. Were there, were there any? <laughs> I'm glad that you're getting a chance to, you know, talk. It's been a while, hey. You haven't done any yeah, interviews and, about together in a while. I don't do a lot about them, no. And you know, it's so funny because I've I've changed careers so many times since together. I became a TV host. I did a, I did my own radio show. I um, yeah. I've done so many different things that it's. And, and again, it's been 20, gosh, what's it, 20, 21 years, 22 years, something like that? It's, yeah. It's yeah. hard to imagine. I've had children since then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to be talking about uh, the shows that you're you're on now and what's going on. Um, I wanted to ask. Did It'll you be a find... short conversation because I'm not doing anything right now. <laughs> so we can, we can oh. cut to the chase there. Uh, Were there... Were there any similarities between you and your character, Jerry? Yeah, it's funny because, again, I haven't thought about this in, in such a long time. And um, my my character, Jerry, was, you know, as, as a whole, we were all kind of playing very sort of naive, dumbed down versions of human beings as, as lots of comedy is written that way. But my character, I, I very much interpreted as this overly caffeinated, intense you know, taking everything so seriously. And mm -hmm. that's very, that was very much me back then. Um, and so even, even the way we shot and the intensity with which I, you know, I took everything so seriously. I went, it was, it's kind of one of my regrets too. I wish I enjoyed myself a little bit more, but, um, but yeah, that definitely came out in, in the character of Jerry. Um, and yeah. Yeah, at the time I was, you know, my character arc was very much mirroring a lot of what was going on in my real life. Um, and so, you know, because we were so close as a group with um, the guns and uh, the production team, we are very much like a family. Like, I think a lot of a lot of our lives were sort of, you know, the storylines were kind of pulled directly. So, I mean, it's, it's now I think back on it, there was a lot more that was um, very much reflective of what was going on. Um, I'm definitely... Uh, very much a Jack Tripper. Now that's a that's an old one. Um, well, I remember know, Jack Tripper. <laughs> May you rest in peace. Love yes. him. Um, so I, I very much I think he was an inspiration. A lot of physical comedy um, that was big. Kevin Kevin Farley was also really big into the physical comedy. So I think he and I kind of ramped each other up in a lot of those um, in a lot of that way. But um, but yeah yeah I would definitely say there was a lot of me. Um, and you know what's funny is is I you know I always considered myself a musician, but by today's standards, I mean I can't even believe I got the job. I mean I can't even believe I, on so many levels because I'm not a fantastic singer. Noah was an amazing singer. Um, he played Chad. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, gifted musician on so many levels. I mean I can strum a guitar and I can you know keep tune for the most part, but. 
Um, but yeah, it was neat. And there was so much of that aspect of it where we were a manufactured group, though it was for a movie, it was very much the same way a lot of the boy bands at the time were sort of being manufactured. And, and you, you had your, this is, gonna, this is gonna be hard to touch on without making somebody feel bad, but you had your Justin Timberlakes, who yeah. was like a, a vocal phenom, you know? Um, and then, you know, you had other people who filled out different characters needed for the group dynamic, you know, but maybe yeah. the vocal gymnastics wasn't their absolute forte. So, um, you know, I think my character was modeled after maybe a, a Justin Timberlake, um, but I certainly was not the vocal phenom of the group. <laughs> But it was fun. It was great. It was like I, I got to live out a, a fantasy um, literally from bartending to two weeks later, my entire life was upended and my world changed and uh, oh. playing arenas and doing weird, crazy stuff that you kind of only dream of doing. And then I got to go back to normal again, which is great, too. What an experience to have had. Did you guys do all the filming in Canada, in Vancouver or just the movie? Um, we did all of it. In fact, I went and looked at a map of where we were. I was trying to figure out where our studio was. So I lived right off of Stanley Park, which is mm. kind of where all the, they put everybody who's doing film production in, in, uh, in Vancouver. And then I remember we would have to drive, I think it was Burnby or Burnaby yeah. or something like that, um, yeah. to the studio every morning at like four o'clock in the morning. Um, but yeah, everything was shot there. We did our second music video there. The hardest part of breaking up is getting back your stuff. Uh, but then, like, on favorite, weekend, well, that's my favorite song of all the together songs. It's brilliant. Is it? Yeah. I think I heard you put it on one of your uh, your games, which I, I have children, so I can't use the F word. Um, they, they're in earshot, but where you played it on episode forty, I think, and nobody could pick, figure it out. Yes. You went through all the boy bands. Yes. And yes. It was like insane, and I was like, I'm so flattered, and then they're like. Backstreet, and then you know, I was like, "Well, no, that was us. That was us." Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was a fun one. That was a fun one. The car. Uh, let's see, the video was the used car salesman theme, which which was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were just all along, you know, for the ride. We we kind of were. It was so chaotic and so much seven days of work constantly for I don't know two years um, straight with no break. And you know, if we weren't filming the show, we were touring and if we weren't touring we were shooting music videos we weren't shooting music videos we were promoting um I think we were a little bit used up but that's why I don't remember it I mean it was so much happened in such a tiny short period of time that so many things I'm just like oh my god we there are episodes I don't own any of the episodes in fact they didn't they didn't give them to us um but Weird. I undug a couple of videotapes from my mom's collection before uh, right after she passed and I, I was watching them and I was like I don't remember shooting this episode I literally was watching it as if it was eyes for the first time that's how tired I think we all were it was wild yeah well they say that yeah. that's what happens when something like is that heightened in your career and especially at a young age it's kind of a whirlwind so you're not alone on that a lot of I think a lot of people entertainers have gone through that it's probably a term for that something like uh you know yeah. first job amnesia or something like that <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it took, you know, it took me forever to catch on to the QT's last name mashup of Mick and Knight. And I was like <laughs> thinking about it a week ago. I'm like, Mick, is that supposed to be a play on McIntyre and Knight? Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love so, that. Fun fact Jerry O'Keefe was originally Jerry King, but there was a uh, an actual touring artist with Jerry King and there was a copyright infringement on their name or whatever we couldn't use it so my oh. chair back you know for the filming it said Jerry King on it um, <laughs> and then they had to change it yeah to Jerry O'Keefe it's kind of funny and then they I, I made them make me a new one because I was like come on and so I've got both both in shadow boxes now somewhere I know actually they all burned I had a house fire in 205 2005 but oh. um it uh it was not Jerry, Jerry O'Keefe. And I don't know where O'Keefe came from. There's probably a lot of things that I probably didn't pick up on that the fans know that were built into the show. Because the guns were really clever that way. They were really, really good at picking up minutia and embedding things in there. So. 
it'll be interesting. Like, I bet you there's a lot of the Easter eggs that the fans notice too. There's this together episode is actually going to be a two parter because um, I spoke with some ladies from another podcast and we talked about the show. And then I got a hold of you. So it'll be interesting cool. to see what they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did Kevin okay. Farley get involved? Some folks don't realize that he's Chris's brother. And I don't know how you can't realize yeah. that, but yeah. So Kevin was, um, I was the last one hired. So it was, it was very 11th hour. So like I said, as soon as I got the job, I flew out the next day. Um, Kevin, I think that everybody auditioned the same way. He might've had a little bit more of like, Hey, you should talk to Kevin. <laughs> and he wasn't a complete unknown. He had been in a lot of Chris's movies and, mm -hmm. um, and it's, tragically, Chris had passed away the year before we started filming. So a lot of that was really, really raw. And it was really, it was really difficult to watch, you know, him have to cope with something so, um, so tragic. And, um, you know, I, you see a lot of Chris in him, but I don't think what people realize is that's not really fair because Kevin and Chris growing up um, together created a lot of the shtick that Chris went on to make famous. And so, you know, if he does anything that resembles Chris's material, you know, it's, oh, Kevin's doing Chris. No, it was actually a lot of what Chris did was Kevinisms. And they were very much equal partners in that. Um, mm. Chris just started his career much earlier. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that Chris wasn't a genius. Of course he was, but so is Kevin. And uh, it really came out. There was one episode that I do remember where Kevin had the opportunity to play his own twin brother. Oh. And so, you know, where he would play two two characters and they would shoot it, you know, one direction, he'd change clothes, reset up, and he'd literally have conversations with himself. And you really saw his genius come out when you you could see him do something like that. But mm. um, I do remember on set almost all the time, all of us were trying to make each other laugh. Um, it was just a very funny vibe, high energy vibe. Kevin was always um, stirring up the kids, as I, I used to call it, because he was so much older than everybody else. Yeah. Um, I mean, hell, I was I was thirty playing, uh, you know, a seventeen year old. I don't even know what Jerry's birthday. It was on. The, I'm looking around because I think I think there is a doll somewhere, and they have a a fake birthday on there, and I don't remember really? how old they tried to. Make me. But um, but yeah, it was weird. You know, I was, I was thirty playing playing a child and. <laughs> That, that also informed my experience when we were out touring because a lot of, I mean, all the bands of that time were actually pretty close in age to Noah and Alex who were in our band and they were all really young. I, I mean, I had graduated college. I had, you know, been out in New York living my life for, you know, a good five years and then this happened. Um, and so I kind of had a very different viewpoint, almost paternal in a way. I think that also goes along with my personality as being overly intense, being overly taking things too seriously, which I've since rid myself of. Kids will do that to you. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it was, it was really kind of interesting. I, I, I didn't envelop myself into the moment as much because I think there was so much of like worry that I expressed or felt about, about the sudden money, the sudden attention, the, sun, the sudden of everything that I, I went very, very much cautiously towards it. And I was worried that, that those who weren't very, very cautious about it were going to get into trouble. And mm -hmm. it was very surreal. That was a very weird tangent that I just took. But again, this is all nostalgic for me because I really haven't thought yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think that's a natural reaction to, especially at the age you were at. It was like, okay, so where is this actually going to go? Because you're thinking about right. your future at the same time, right? Yeah. I think- 30s yeah. pretty classic age for that <laughs> yeah yeah it was a uh, it was a it was a late stage game but it, I I wouldn't trade it for the world I mean I I think um I think there were it made it easier for me to transition away I'll tell you that mm -hmm. um it, just to kind of see it for what it was and see it for the moment um I think I was so busy trying not to get lost in the moment that I missed a lot of it you know as far as you know really kind of sitting back and smelling the roses, mm. but you know, there's time for that. <laughs> we hope. That's, that's the nice thing about later afterwards, you realize, oh, you kind of take in every moment 
a little bit differently, right? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My life has been very much, if, if, if I started my intensity journey in my late twenties, it is just, I've been mellowing out ever, ever since. <laughs> so, uh, so it's good. It's good that it all happened. It was fun. Um, the Britney Spears tour. Now, how much of that do you remember? Where she uh, did it again. Um, <laughs> I remember all of it and it was actually played up our participation in our tour. I'll just, I'll be the first to confess it right now was far less than what, uh, what I think it was marketed as, um, MTV, their marketing geniuses. That's what our whole show was about was a play on how you can market anything or anybody into reality. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, it's the Ricky story or, or Ricky, Ricky Martin. Yeah. Ricky Martin story. You know, mm -hmm. we're like, we're going to take this young kid and make him a star. And then they did, you know, and you can do that with boy bands too. Um, so when we played, when we toured with Britney, we were very much the side stage where they, people sat on bales of hay as they came way too early to a Britney Spears concert that wasn't going to start for another two hours. So we, uh, you know, we met Britney, we were backstage with Britney um, a couple of times, but for the most part, we were kind of like the, uh, the circus sideshow act way before it started. But it was, it was definitely an honor because I tell you, she is one of the hardest working um, artists that I've met then or since. Um, I've never met anybody who was um, that on top of her game at the time. And, uh, mm. and it's, it's easy to see why I think the stress, you can, you can see what happens when you're working 18 hours a day at that level of intensity, um, mm -hmm. kind of bringing it all back full circle to, uh, to, to my intensity journey. It's, you, you know, you got to learn to chill out, but <clears throat> I have mad respect for her and her skills. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was fun. And I do remember one incident where our mics went out. So we would sing to track. Um, we weren't lip syncing and we could actually pull it off. Um, I would say plausibly, uh, we were we weren't winning any you know harmony vocal competitions, but mm -hmm. um, but you know we were we were fun we were the fun entertaining show and I remember our um, our tracks completely went out just like it did in the movie. Um, I, there was a scene I think at a spelling bee in the very early in the movie where uh, Kevin or uh, Doug I guess was his character's name who basically tries to carry the show without any music. We all walk off stage and he's out there. But, um, but the same thing happened in, uh, for real on stage. Our tracks went out and we just kept going and, you know, the crowd loved it and we just completely riffed and pulled it off somehow miraculously. And I, I think that was probably our crowning achievement of all time. Um, but we had, you know what, the, the best concerts we did were the radio tours. Um, I had no idea what a radio tour was until we were doing them. Mm. And I remember uh, Jones Beach Amphitheater it's got to be like 20,000 people at this place. And we, we were <laughs> headlining this radio tour, which meant that like Enrique Iglesias was going on before us and opening up. It was just very bizarre um, wow. to go from complete, again, complete, complete obscurity in a couple of months. I mean, really, we're talking super compressed time frame to all of a sudden we would start um, we would start calculus with our backs turned to the audience. And as each one of us sang, we would turn around as our, you know, as a, our first time to, and, I, and my character was the first one to sing. And I remember I turned around and really saw the crowd staring up truly at the first time. Cause when you run out on stage, you're just like, get in position. Yeah. And, um, and they were all singing my words and I almost couldn't function. I just <laughs> tears and like I, that will forever be one of the greatest moments of my life. I can only imagine how that must be if I had written that song. Like if I was a musician that had written this heartfelt song and had people singing back to me, um, my words at a concert, I've got a good friend here in Tennessee, who is a pretty big name celebrity of the same time, uh, musician and, um, and he writes those kinds of songs. And I just, I just look at him with awe. I'm like, I can't believe you get to do that every single night. And uh, yeah. yeah, 
So those were probably the more impactful moments and, you know, kind of bumping elbows with Destiny's Child before they became the big thing. And it was a real big moment in, in history where people were exploding. And I was like, we were all these little planted seeds in the bed and we were just sprouting. And, um, and the machine just took off and ran with so many of them. So that was, uh, those good memories. Yeah. The excitement. Oh, wow. Yeah. A lot of cool experiences for sure. And that kind of segues good into the next question where I'm talking about the writing, because the I understand that you did a fair amount of the writing and these songs are literally great pop music. I think they're written very well. Um, how much did you have to do with the writing? So I wrote one song on the first album. Alex wrote one song on the first album. Um, I guess what I co-wrote. Um, and then, but MTV didn't realize this was going to be, you know, a big success um and would spawn a second album so by the time we got to album number two uh they were like look you can you can help and contribute all you want we're not giving you any credits because at that point in time um there was a label in the mix and they were reaching their hands in to get their their chunk of the money and mtv had their own you know production for the for the music and they wanted their piece and we sold i don't know we printed over a million albums uh total and to give you an idea of how how it worked back then um uh, i maybe saw three to five thousand dollars from all those albums total oh, no. the vast majority of that was ascap because i had written on the first album um yeah, so that's how that's how it works, and mm. it was uh, it was a lot of lot of uh, hands in the cookie jar. But so on the second album, you know, of course, we were all green, and you know, none of us had any leverage to kind of change the dynamic of what was going on. And I'm not I'm not complaining. I think it was wrong, but I'm not I'm not saying I would I wouldn't do it again. Um, but we would sit in the studio with these amazing producers, um, Josh and Brian from KNS and Vite Wren and and all these. They were, they were Britney's producers, NSYNC's producers, and we would, uh, a lot of the songs actually were um, cut, like Britney cuts or NSYNC cuts that we would then have to make fun, or turn around and make funny. Ones that didn't land on their finished albums. It was, you know, if they, you know, are going to do it now, they'll record like, you know, sometimes 30, 40 more songs, and just the ones that didn't make it, we would turn around. There was one like, uh, I Want to Know Your Name, which was a Britney song. We're like, how do we make this funny? And we just would sit around and just make ourselves giggle with rewriting the lyrics, you know? Should yeah. I let my package go? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> and Kevin was was great at that. So it really was collaborative. And I think that also helped a lot of the buy-in. You know, even though it wasn't, you know, we weren't going to see a, a ton of money, you know, from it. Um, I think when we, when we did do the series, we all felt a far bigger piece of ownership of each episode that we would do because you know like the monkeys every episode would be based around one of the songs that we put on the album mm. and that's how we would you know wrap up the storyline or whatever so you know with the concert at the end and a neat little package but um mm. yeah that was really that was that was probably the the part I enjoyed the most was was participating in the creation of those things because you know we couldn't we didn't really ad lib in yeah. the in the acting at all most of it was just so well written that it didn't need it and um hmm. or or nor would it would it i think in the time frame that we had to shoot would it have worked it's funny we were shooting uh the movie at the same time they were doing um best in show that movie and they were okay. staying at the same hotel in in vancouver and they're 100 percent ad-libbed and of course that's best in show was uh uh christopher guest yeah who did spinal tap Mm -hmm. it was a weird was it christopher guest gosh I'm, I'm well i remember the title of the movie but i don't remember much more about it so so they would literally go into these rehearsal rooms oh you got to go watch fred fred lillard and um um oh my gosh they were so great mm -hmm. and, but they would go into the rehearsal we'd be in a rehearsal room in the hotel learning dance moves and then we'd go out in the hall to kind of take a break and we could hear them ad-libbing scenes to try to come up for the next day's shooting. And it was amazing. It was absolute, I mean, it was astounding to, you know, to kind of be a fly on the wall for some of that. And mm. uh, but that's how Spinal Tap was created, right? So it was, here we were, the next iteration of it across the room with, you know, the guy who created Spinal Tap. Very, very surreal. 
Man. Very neat. I never, never really put the two together. I knew that Best in Show was there, but I never really put the Spinal Tap preview to that whole thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling. No, you're good. But, I uh, mean, and I'm glad you brought up the monkeys too, because that was something I was thinking. Um, did you guys take anything from what they had already done or think about even what they had already done while doing this show? I'd like to say yes, but I think Kevin and I were the only ones old enough to even remember what the monkeys <laughs> were, you know? So Good point. Uh, I'm sure the writers probably did a lot of that sort of background study of, of what, what works in this genre and how to do it. But, uh, but no, mm -hmm. I know that, that's actually a good excuse to go back and, and watch the monkeys episodes uh, with a new appreciation for, for sure. Now the loss of Michael, I know it hit the fans hard as I imagine it was really difficult for all of you guys as well. And how has his memory and legacy been kept alive since it's been so many years? Yeah, that was, um, uh, Mike, uh, Michael was, um, he, he's, uh, he was one of the most incredible human beings. You know, there's a lot of, when people, when people pass too soon, um, regardless of who they were, or what they represented in life, you know, there's, there's, they get, they get a lot of, um, credit, you know, and, and I don't know really how to say this. Michael was everything that they said about him. And then a little bit more, mm -hmm. he, um, he was truly a, a, a living angel and, uh, he lived it every day. I, I feel so unbelievably blessed and lucky to have been in his atmosphere. He had survived and dealt with so much in his life. And I never, never saw him complain once. And let me tell you, there was a lot of complaining in that, in that whole entertainment world. And he was, he was just such a standout, um, such pure joy and energy. And he was so unbelievably talented. That kid could write um, he had one functioning lung. His diaphragm was paralyzed the whole time. And he's kicking wow. out songs and recording, keeping up with the rest of us. And it was always terrifying when we would go out on tour because we were required or they demanded that we put on a full show. And that was hard for a healthy 30 year old in the best shape of my life. Um, not somebody who was, who is, you know, been through what he had been through um, with Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and the radiation and all that stuff. It was just, it was mind blowing that he did it and took care of his family emotionally. I mean, he really was their support system because they were suffering because he was suffering, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And yeah. he was the, he was the stand up guy. He was taking care of everybody the whole time. And he still is in a lot of ways. And to answer your question about um, his legacy. So, um, he has the Michael Cuccioni Foundation, which um, raises money for children, um, basically in the same circumstances. Um, he's profoundly affected so many other charities. In fact, the year he, before he passed, he was named Vancouver's Man of the Year. Um, it's mm. quite an accolade since he died before, well, right up, right after 16th birthday. Um, and I, right after, for the first year or two, I would do a lot of charity type concerts, um, working with his mom, Gloria. Um, sadly, that we've, we've lost some, somewhat of touch. We, we usually reach out every two or three years, but, uh, you know, time will do that. Um, but yeah, man, he, uh, he was, he was pretty, pretty special. He was probably the highlight of the whole together experience. I bet. And like, I'm, I'm sorry that you guys had to go through so much, but I think like he's, he's just been so inspiring to so many. And I think that's, um, it's important that all of us try to, you know, keep his legacy alive throughout. Um, so we'll be sharing some links to, um, to the foundation so people can get involved. Good, good. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Lots to, lots to smile uh, about. Yeah. That's the thing. Get to remember those good times and the, the things that put a smile on your face. Yeah. Now, who, 
were you good? Did you guys actually watch any of the boy bands that were going on at the time? Obviously the big two BSB and NSYNC going back to like <clears throat> new kids and everything. Um, did you guys have a favorite boy band? Um, oh, we, we, we got along famously with NSYNC. We did, we did some, um, I'm trying to think if we toured with them or we just did promotion with them. For some reason we got paired with them a lot and they got it. They 100% were down with together. They thought it was the funniest nice. thing. Um, and and yeah, we, I mean, we studied the boy bands, but we were also spending a lot of time with, time with them. <clears throat> mm. um, Backstreet Boys, we didn't really have a lot of interaction with, although I think they, you know, they respected it. There were, you know, a couple that, that saw us, I think, as a threat to some degree because they, they received the we're making fun of you angle and not the we're tribute to you angle. I think mm. our storylines were undercutting in their minds and maybe maybe fairly so, um, all the hard work that they put into it, um, which is certainly not the way I saw our show. I mean, we were not, we were not saying, hey, look, anybody can do this. Um, but I think that I think there might have been a little bit of, you know, rub the wrong way. Um, mm. I do remember. <laughs> in New Jersey, Kevin, um, jokingly, of course, on a radio show, started a fight with um, the manager of 98 Degrees. That that was that was really interesting. He was trying to challenge 98 Degrees in character to a cage fight um, and saying that Michael could take all of them. Of course, you know, 98 Degrees, all these guys were heavy weightlifters, bodybuilder <laughs> types, and, you know, good-looking dudes. And, um, you know, so he was, uh, he was trying to get under the skin. I remember we got a nasty call from, <laughs> from their manager while we were on air, um, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but yeah, man, they were, you know, I love, I love the whole boy band genre. I wasn't a big fan of boy band music going into it, um, but seeing it from the inside, um, you know, there's nothing, there, there's nothing you can take away from those guys. They work their tails off. Um, mm -hmm talented and it takes a lot to be in a room with four other dudes and not want to kill each other in that <laughs> amount of pressure 24 7 and that's really what 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 they're doing is they're throwing you in a pressure cooker um and saying hey if you if you can deal with all this torture we'll give you a little bit of money and um and you'll get to see the world and you know it works out if it can work out i i, I don't know the inside scoop as to how well that's worked out in other bands i know we fared okay mm -hmm. uh, we had our moments but, um, but yeah, no, that was, that was really neat. Yeah. NSYNC, I would say that was probably our, our, uh, our brethren, if, mm. if you will. And it's actually funny. Justin lives just up the street from, uh, from my farm here in Nashville now and his wife and, and their kids. So Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Nice. That doesn't, that doesn't even remotely work in this one. I, I, I don't even know where, where I was going with that. <laughs> Uh, he's a he's yeah. a good old country boy. Let me let me put it to you that way. Man so. of the woods. That's right. That's J JT. His farm's much bigger than mine, though. Let me tell you, they did they did okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, segueing into what you did after the band, um, there was a time that you hosted TRL. Yeah. Guest yeah. hosting. Tell us about how that happened. That was actually a good story. Um, so. I was living in New York still, or I still had my place in New York, and we happened to be there. We had already done TRL. Uh, Carson had interviewed us a bunch of times, and I think, you know, our, our videos were rotating on uh, on the show. And he was doing um, that Cancun trip that they do every year or did every year uh, with TRL. Mm -hmm. And I think he, I think it's the time he, he met and fell deeply in love or lust or whatever it was with, uh, with someone in Cancun. I don't remember. Tara which, Reed? Which Tara <laughs> Reed. It was Tara Reed. Yeah. And he, he didn't get on the plane to come home. And so they were going to, and now TRL was live, live, live. And uh, they were scrambling to find somebody to host the show. And I guess they had gone down their roster of, of in-house talent and couldn't find anybody. Um, I happened to be literally, you know, 10 blocks away. And my agent's like, hey, would you do this? And um uh, I was like, I guess I'd never done any, anything like this ran. I mean, physically ran because I couldn't afford the time. I mean, it was like 
we went live at three. I mean, this was like 248. And so I'm <laughs> running up the street in my street clothes, uh, get to 1515 Broadway, which is where MTV is. And um, going up the escalator, they're sticking an IFB in my ear. They're handing me a microphone. I've got cue card guy on the top of the escalator. He's like, this is how we're going to do it. And you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I'm like, oh, and by the way, you're going to interview Madonna. And I'm like, what? What? No it way. Was, it was so much at, at once that I was like, okay. You know, I didn't have time to get nervous. So I, I literally was walking into the studio as they were counting the live clock in and boom. And I literally grabbed the mic, turned around. And that was the first time um, I'd ever done anything hosting. And that was when I was like, this is what I want to do. It was wow. the energy, the thinking on your feet, the constant engagement, the excitement. Um, you know, there was no sit and wait in your trailer for 30 minutes while they relight the setup and you come in and act for five. You know, it was it was where what I was born to do. Um, wow. And so from that point on, I had to kind of fill my, you know, and I did some more acting after that. But I was really kind of like, wow, well, if I can't get one of those jobs, I don't really want to do entertainment anymore. Um and so I had actually decided to quit acting. Um, I just shot the last film I, I had done, I ever did, was Austin Powers. And I, would, I told my agent, I'm like, hey, I'm out. And um, I literally even moved away from California, um, went back to New York, and uh, I was kind of minding my own business. And then While You're Out, which was a show on TLC, a uh, home makeover show, one of the first, there was Bob Vila, which was a, a how-to show, then there was the trading spaces, which broke ground as being an entertainment home makeover show. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third one was ours while you're out and they were looking for a replacement host. And, um, and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, that thing I really love to do and building, which is what I do. I uh, went yeah. to school for architecture. I was never meant to, never meant to be in this industry. I, I don't think. Um, and uh, so anyway, I kind of put two and two together and then kind of jumped ship and, and went into the world of hosting. So Wow. It's a, a weird transition to make, isn't it? <laughs> From boy band to carpenter host. I, I love how you've taken the two things that you enjoy so much and put them together. I think that's the dream right there. You know, with the carpentry. <clears throat> I think, wouldn't that be, you and John Knight should do a show together. That would be fun. Because right? now he's yeah, got Farmhouse sure. Fixer. Yeah. That'd be cool if you guys pulled off a, a few episodes together I, or something like that. Well, I'll throw this out there. I'm willing to do an episode. I'm not sure I'm willing to do a full show anymore. I got a, a pretty cush job as dad right now. So Aww. I'm digging on that. But um, yeah, the the, uh, the entertainment world is not really um, super conducive when, you know, you got to hustle. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of plane time um, away from home time that as soon as I, uh, I had my second son, um, I realized I, I can't do it. And so I was actually doing, um, I was hosting a music uh, show, basically VJ type show for country music television here in Nashville, um, 2010 to 2013. And then my second son was born in 2012 and they were flying me all over the place. And it was a lot of fun. I was interviewing lots of uh, really interesting, neat people. So it was another kind of combination of things I love to do, but um, mm. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it, be on an airplane away. So my contract was up in 2013 and, uh, and I walked away and I hadn't looked back really. There's been a couple things where I've just dabbled, you know, like guest star type stuff, but I'm not interested in the, uh, the 18 hour days and, yeah. you know, the gotta be here, you know, in Chicago tomorrow or whatever it was. So it's, uh, it's nice. I, I, I think I, all of this was a journey to find my my true calling, maybe, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Being a dad. It's nice that you found such a great balance. You know, I think that's the dream. So we're happy for you. I think that's great. I've been lucky, you know, I, you know, that I haven't had to, you know, kind of jump back into a fray and, you know, maybe when this is all, uh, this parenting thing is all over and they've flown the coop, I got at least eight more years on that. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more and kind of hit my creative niche. But for now, I've been doing a lot of building. That's kind of where I get my creative outlet, the mm. barn built. Um, yeah, I've got a, a farm shop that I'm finishing building out in, um, out in Leapers Fork here in Tennessee. And that's going to be my, 
my business headquarters where I create custom building and cooking experiences. Uh, we had to kind of shutter every for uh, for COVID, but we yeah. hope to reopen relatively soon. Great. And people can find you information about it on Instagram, on your Instagram, right? So that if they wanted to uh, check it out. Yeah, I'm terrible at social media. I'll tell you that right now. I post <laughs> a couple pictures here and there. Um, I don't think I've posted a Twitter in, I don't know, 10 years. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, the Building Barn, it had, we've got our own website. Um, again, it's not really fully functioning right now. We're uh, I bought the farm just before COVID. Mm -hmm. And since we weren't taking any clients, we used to rent a local farm since we weren't taking any clients um, for that period of time. I just kind of hung back and been slowly building the, the farm or the barn out um, for the business. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Again, it's kind of like, you know, I'm the relaxed guy now. I'm not the super overly intense guy now. So I'm, uh, I'm like, whatever. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Are you still in touch with the guys from the group? Every once in a while, I see Ke Kevin would come to Nashville. Uh, he was shooting a show here for a while. So I would see him every once in a while. Alex and I touch base uh, quite a bit. I've tried to get a hold of Noah so many different times, um, but uh, he's changed his number. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the guns uh, occasionally, but not, you know, not so much. There was, there was the idea to do some form of reunion. Um, mm -hmm. I think this was when I was still at CMT and um, we tried to, we tried to cobble something together. And every once in a while, Alex, who, who's still hustling, God bless him, He'll, uh, he'll get us a gig and he, he'll try to talk us all into joining to, you know, to show up playing with O-Town or, or something like that. And I'm yeah. like, dude, I, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't I don't have the energy for that anymore. And we'd have to rehearse and we'd have to do all that stuff. It just sounds so tiring. Um, yeah. All that being said, I think if the right opportunity popped up and, and made it doable for us, but I can't I can't hit the road. So um but yeah, no, I, you've, you've just reminded me that there's a lot of people I need to reach out to. I need to reach out to Michael's mom again and, uh, mm. and, and the guys and just kind of, kind of say, hi. I don't know. You might've had more luck getting a hold of them than, than I have. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's tough. No. Well, it's life. Mm. It's, it's like that with every, anything. The people that you hung out with like 20 years ago are sometimes not, you know, they're off doing their own things. So just how it works out yeah. for everybody and yeah i get to watch my cares what's that go ahead finish what you were saying i'm sorry well i just get to, you know i enjoy seeing them like you know alex alex still works pretty regularly so i'll just be watching tv and you know with my kids and all of a sudden there's alex and you know same thing with kevin um mm. i think noah kind of you know is taking a break um doing his own thing but um it's nice to see see that you know see them continuing to do what they love so talented that you know it'd be a waste if they didn't mm -hmm. no that's the thing and it you're in a happy place and i'm really hoping the same for the rest of the guys have you ever considered doing your own podcast because you can kind of just do it whenever you want mm, i not with folks like you who do it so well <laughs> it's a You'd be great. it's a crowded space it's a crowded space and i don't i don't that's really have true. i don't feel like yeah, that is true. Um, I don't, I don't feel like I have a whole lot to say um, that I haven't said. I wrote a book, which pretty much said just about everything that I, I felt like I needed to. I, it's funny, I wrote it. Uh, I wrote a book for my kids, which was never meant to be published. And it was just basically, you know, it, I, I watched that movie where the, the dad finds out he's terminal and his son isn't even born yet. Really sad movie. I think Tom mm -hmm. Hanks was in it. I can't remember, but it really messed me up. And so he had left these notes for his kid, right? And, you know, like, don't shave like this, shave like this. And it was really kind of cute, touching. It might have been, you know, very hallmarky in some ways. But um, so I just, you know, I got this right after my first son was born. I was like, I got to write, I got to write everything down. You know, I don't know. I just it wasn't necessarily, I had the sense of doom, but I was just like, I, I got to do it. And then I was kind of piecing it together and talking to, um, a friend of mine who's a literary agent they're like hey yeah let me take a, a look at that it would be really interesting and, and originally I was like oh, I don't know how I feel about that and then they're like this would be actually pretty useful because a lot of it was about how to hustle as it turns out it's the art of the hustle basically of how to how to get the job because I realized with very little talent um, I managed to work in a lot of different um, 
careers that are very tough to break into. And so my gift or my, my talent is breaking in. I broke into movies. I broke in, and I'm not an actor. I mean, I never was the, I would, I remember when I got to New York, um, going to auditions alongside of, um, oh my God, the who's who became, I'm trying to think, Primal Fear. Who was the, Ed Norton. Okay. Ed Norton and Primal Fear. So he and I very much were typed very similarly. So we would read for the same parts. And I would just sit there and I'm like, why am I here? This guy, you could just look at him in the, in the waiting room and be like, this guy's an actor. This guy knows what the hell he's doing. He knows what's up. And I just was, I just felt like I was some kind of imposter. But anyway, I digress. Um, not a great singer, but ended up doing a whole bunch of music stuff. Not a, you know, I sound like Kermit the Frog. You can listen to my voice here and, you know, tell that. But somehow I ended up doing a radio show, you know. So I was like, well, if I was fighting all these, you know, challenges where I had to jump the hurdle of talent and still get in, what was I doing right? And I guess that's what my book was about. It's called Breaking In. Um, and so in it, I kind of follow my, the trajectory of my, my career and, and just the things that I've learned along the way. Um, I said a lot of books, I'm a heavy reader. I love reading. Um, but anyway, I, I really, this is a lot, the longest winded answer to, have you ever thought about doing a podcast in the <laughs> I world? Um, I love it. But, but no, I've kind of, I think I've, I've said, I've said that, uh, just about everything I need to say <laughs> at this point, more than anybody really should listen to. Well, I think you've done great at all the things that we've seen you in, and I, I'm really like impressed with your talents. So don't cut yourself short. You've done a great well, hey, job. I'm not. I'm not complaining. I had fun, and every yeah. once in a while, I make myself laugh, and that's all. That's all that matters. If I can pull that off from time to time, I can make my kids laugh. So I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm doing something right. Exactly, and that's what matters the most is uh, friends, family things like that. So I, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Cause like, it was really exciting to have you on the show and thanks that for listening to the show. I'm honored. No, you, you do a great job. I, what was I listening to the NWA and, oh, Brad Frischetti's, um, interview. That Bad, was, yeah. that was solid. You know, we toured with LFO, uh, not toured, but we did a show and I want to, I want to say that that was one of the most, um, again, it, we were a high, we were playing a high school. Mm -hmm. um, it was very early, and I just remember those guys made such a huge impact. I mean, they were 100% legit. They were not buying into their own hype. They were just so excited for the opportunity to do what they love to do, and it was so infectious that mm -hmm. I was just like, ah, I get it. I totally get it. And, uh, yeah, it's just a real tragedy that, uh, that they lost um, Rich and Devin, but um, but they're being well represented and their, their honor and memory is being well, well represented as well by, uh, by Frischetti. So anyway, great yeah. work and keep doing what you're doing. I hope you, uh, continue to get, uh, great guests like that. I know you will. Well, thank you, Evan. And thanks for being a great guest and maybe we'll talk again sometime. That'd be awesome. Hey, anytime I'm here in my okay. wife's office, as you can see. Sweet. <laughs> I like the setup. It looks great. She's a photographer. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, she's really, really. She, now she's talented. So, I, uh, I get to live vicariously through that ability. So she can, she can do things I never dreamed of. But yeah, I'm a lucky guy. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I wish you and your family all the best right now. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a tag on social media. I know you might not see it, but when this comes out, I'll tag you and everything, and we'll go from there. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Evan. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.